Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. All right, so this is the first day of your favorite class at the University at Buffalo. My name is Jeff Challen. This is 421-521. How many people have heard about this class before? How many people are excited to take this class this semester? Ah, OK. Few, fewer hands. There's some uncertainty here. So all I want to do today is we're going to talk about the class. We'll talk a little bit about uh, my, you know, my objectives for this semester and what we're going to hope to accomplish together. And then we're going to go through a long litany of sort of course policies and other sort of relatively boring yet somewhat spicy first day material. All right? Um, can everybody hear me, including those people in the back? Yabas? Yeah, a little bit. Do you have cotton in your ears? No. OK. <laughs> I, can, I can come down the road a little bit. How's that? Good? OK. Uh, I prefer not to use the mic if I don't have to. So, um, so let me just uh, let me just fix this. <laughs> ah. All right, so the reason I'm standing here today, the reason I have the job that I have, the reason that I met my wife, the reason that we moved to Buffalo is because I took this class. I took this class, oh, I don't know, it's a gazillion years ago. I'm not going to stop saying how many years ago it was at Harvard. I was actually a physics major at the time. I came to Harvard, I was going to major in physics, I was going to un you know, unlock the mysteries of the physical universe. And instead, I started to develop this interest in computer science. And I took this class on computer operating systems from, from Margot Seltzer in 2001. And I decided to spend my life unlocking the mysteries of computer systems rather than the physical universe, which are, you know, maybe a little bit less interesting, but maybe a little more practical, right? Um, so I started, you know, my journey with this class. I continued it through a PhD. I TA'd this class a bunch of times during graduate school. Uh, and this is my third year teaching it here. Um, I never thought that I'd be doing this, right? So I, and it's really exciting for me year after year to share this material with you guys. And maybe this will start you on your own sort of journey towards you know, being a computer science professor, right? Isn't that what you always all want to be? Yeah, not quite. Okay. <laughs> so maybe instead of this great job, you'll get a job like one of those like okay mediocre jobs at Google or Facebook or whatever. Like that, that's okay too, right? Uh, we don't we don't discriminate against those people. Um, so I'm I'm kind of curious. A couple of people, why why are you taking this class? I'm gonna I do this a lot. I'm gonna pick on people. Unfortunately, I don't know my names. What about you? Left row hat. Yep. It was a requirement. OK. That's an OK reason to take it. I, I hope that by the time you finish, you're not wishing you took the requirement in the other semester. Um, someone else. What about you over there? Striped shirt. Yep, I'm looking. Yep. She's a couple more 400 level classes. OK, awesome. Uh, anybody else? Any other different reasons? Yeah, right there. It looked like you were raising your hand. Yeah, sure. <laughs> he wants to learn operating systems, et cetera, right? So yeah, hopefully we can do that and the et cetera. Um, so who can tell me what an operating system is? Before we start delving into the internals of operating systems, it would be nice to know what they are. Right? So what, what is a computer operating system? Yeah. Uh, it's an interface between the user and the hardware. OK, it's an interface between the user and the hardware. What else is it? It's something that's up on the slide for people who are interested in accumulating early semester brownie points. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a it's a computer program, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think, that's, I think that's important to keep in mind, because uh, as, as mysterious as operating systems may seem to you throughout the semester, they are computer programs, right? It's a computer program that has some special powers and privileges, but fundamentally it is a computer program. And I think it's fairly interesting because if you think about all the courses that we have in this department, there are very few of them where we spend the entire semester studying a particular computer program or type of computer program, right? Maybe a course on compilers, if we had one, would be that kind of class. Um, distributed systems typically talks about a lot of different things, but we're going to spend the whole semester focusing on the design of this one particular computer program. And the computer program actually does two things, right? The first thing, is, as someone pointed out, is that it serves as an interface that allows the computer to multiplex hardware resources that are shared by multiple users, by multiple programs, and we want that sharing to be done effectively. 
and safety, right? The other thing that operating systems do is they typically implement a set of useful abstractions that make using the computer easier. And these two things sort of go together, right? The interface that operating systems provide both safely multiplexes hardware as well as providing a set of these useful abstractions, right? Yeah? Are my notes available online? I, I should take over under bets with my TAs about how long it'll be before someone asks that question, right? So, <laughs> uh, the notes will be available online, yes. All right, I'm glad we got that out of the way. I thought about putting it in the slides, but I was like, ah, I want someone to ask a question today. So, good question. Um, the multiplexing allows people to use the same set of hardware resources safely, right? And the abstractions simplify the way that we use these, these hardware resources, right? And so these jobs are incredibly important for how we use computer systems today, and that makes the operating system an extremely important and interesting piece of computer software, right? And that's why we're going to spend all semester studying it. However, let me ask you a series of questions. How many of you have ever developed or participated in operating system development? Okay. Where's Guru? His hand should be up. There it is. Okay. Go. Okay. Um, how many of you regularly program in languages that use operating system abstractions directly? How many people ever make a call to open in a low-level language that's actually just wrapping the system call interface? OK. You should stop doing that. There are better languages now, right? But uh, anyway, I'm, I'm teasing you, right? But the point is that a lot of us don't use these low-level languages anymore, right? And then why, well, so why do we study these systems at all, right? Who cares? Who cares about operating systems? You know they exist. People worked on them for a long time. The people who worked on them are kind of old and crufty and wear funny glasses and, um, you know, whatever. I mean, it's kind of dead. It's a dead, dead area, right? Why? So why, why do you guys think we would study these? Why is this course required for computer scientists to take? Any ideas? Yeah. Right, so, and, and so if you're going to write software, it might behoove you to understand something about the platform, about the actual system, right? To understand some of the limitations of these really nice abstractions that operating systems provide. That's a nice reason. What else? I'm going to hunt for volunteers again. Yeah, you. Yeah, I just pick, I just point in a general area, and then whoever says, <laughs> who me first? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you did. I have a laser pointer, but I don't want to like hurt anybody. You know? <laughs> yeah. So almost every computer out there in the world, right, from your laptops, your desktops, <laughs> servers that make uh, and make up sort of cloud data centers, even little moats that you use to do sort of deeply embedded programming, they all run some form of an operating system. So yeah, operating systems are everywhere. That's another good reason. What else? <coughs> Why else would we study a program that's been developed for 40 or 50 years? Yeah. It's helpful to know what it's doing when it breaks. Ah, when it breaks, yeah. How many people's operating systems regularly break? How many people are using Windows? <laughs> oh, just kidding. I shouldn't, shouldn't pick on Windows. I don't know. Uh, I was going to make it through a whole class without making a Windows joke, but I didn't make it. Didn't make it through five minutes. Um, all right. So, th so here are some reasons I think I think are nice. So we've already touched on a couple of these. This is how computers really work, right? So if you're a computer scientist, this is sort of part of learning about the world of reality. Even if you program in these nice high-level languages and you never have to understand how some of these abstractions are provided, it's really nice to, to learn how it's actually done, right? The second thing someone else touched on, operating systems are everywhere. But this is sort of my favorite, right? Which is operating systems are these incredibly important computer programs that people have been developing and redesigning and testing and re-implementing and rethinking for decades, right? So these are really mature, elegant solutions to difficult design problems, right? And so by studying these, we may get, be able to gather some intuition about how to program ourselves. Right, and how to s handle some of these same problems, right? By sort of studying these, these are like the great masterworks of computer science. It's like the Monets and the, you know, the Renoirs of the computer science world, right? These are the, these things. At this point, after years and years of of continuous testing and and implementation, are are pretty solid, right? Why would you? So the the other big part of this class that some of you guys may have heard about is that we're going to do a lot of programming, right? You're actually going to be building large, 
parts of a real little operating system, right? Why would we expose you to this, right? This, this, is, this is hard. <laughs> it's going to be hard. But why, why take on this challenge? Why would you actually program an operating system? I mean, all the operating systems we could possibly need are already, they already exist, right? So why would we do these programming assignments? Absolutely. So implementing these, and this is part of the reason for the whole framework that this class uses, is that implementing these things yourself is incredibly helpful for figuring out how operating systems work. Um, let me go through some other reasons. So operating systems programming, this is sort of the big D, three Ds, right? Design. How many people regularly design a piece of code before they actually implement it? Okay, I see that's maybe 5%, right? Part of the reason you guys are able to get away with this is that the pieces of code that you're writing are pretty small and well-contained. Some of these assignments you're going to do this semester are not small and well-contained. They're big and sprawling and complex. And you will not be able to do them well without sitting down and designing them. And the fact is that most of the software you guys work on in the real world is going to be big and complex. If it was small and easy, no one would pay you the big bucks to do it, right? Um, so the design aspect. These are also hard, right? And to some degree, the difficulty of this course is directly related, I believe. And if you don't believe me, then you know, maybe you should consider not taking it um, to the benefit that students get from it, right? You're going to struggle with these assignments. And in that struggle, you will become stronger programmers. And you will sharpen your critical thinking abilities about how to do this sort of thing. And a lot of your time is going to be spent debugging. Right? And operating systems are notoriously difficult to debug. This is not the type of thing you're going to be able to do in Eclipse by hitting a little play button or whatever, or the bug button, or <laughs> whatever button it is that you hit in Eclipse that miraculously fixes all your problems. Right? We don't have that here. Right? Um, so you're going to actually have to think about, and, and some of the bugs, you're going to see them like once out of maybe 10,000 runs. Right? But the, but the law of this class is whenever you have a bug that doesn't repeat very often, it always happens when we test your code. Right? <laughs> I'm serious. Like, that is our testing suite somehow is, violates the laws of probability. Right? Um, all right. So here's how the class is set up. Right? So there, I, I really see this as happening in sort of two parts. And we're going to try to build as much of a bridge between these two sections as we can. But I can't always uh, claim that we're going to be perfectly synchronized. Right? So last people, time, people said it was weird that we were learning about memory management when we were implementing the file system calls. And sorry, that's just kind of how the scheduling works out. It's difficult to get that to, do, to work. Um, so we, we do this sort of conceptual stuff in lectures, and we go over some of that material in recitations, and then, then we go over it in exams. And then you also do a fair amount of probing. Right? That's the second really important part of the class. Right? So let me go over just briefly the learning objectives I have for the conceptual part of the class. Right? I just want to establish some guidelines about what I want us to accomplish by the end of the semester. Right? Um, so I want you guys, by the time we're done, to understand the abstractions that are supported by modern operating systems. I want you to be able to describe and understand how uh, operating system policies and mechanisms effectively multiplex and protect hardware resources. And sort of have some context of the history and the ongoing uh, status of operating system development. Right? And, and also, one of the other things that's cool about operating systems is, is the story of operating system design and development is really this love story with hardware. Right? As hardware has changed and adapted and new hardware features have emerged, operating systems have taken advantage of them. And, and sometimes the needs and design of operating systems have motivated new hardware features. Right? So that's part of what makes this really interesting. And that's part of what continues to make operating system design relevant. Right? Because we keep having these new devices that are different than the old devices. And we keep having to rethink about how ways that we do things. Right? So for example, who can tell me a significant hardware change to most of your machines that's occurred within the last five years? It's still occurring. What's that? OK, uh, touch screens, that's a good one. It's not the one I'm thinking of, though. Yeah. 64-bit, OK, that's a good one. Also not the one I'm thinking of. Multi-core, multi-core is a great one. So that's very, very good. I'm thinking of something in the storage stack, actually. SSDs. SSDs, right? How many people have an SSD on their laptop? How many people have an SSD on their desktop? Oh, man, you guys got to join the club. It's pretty cool. Um, so that, and, and that's actually changing the way that operating systems are designed, right? Because SSDs have very different trade-offs than, than traditional spinning disks. And so you're seeing a lot of new innovation within the operating system 
uh, area in terms of how do we fit SSDs into the traditional storage area, right? So this is not a dead, these are not the Dead Sea Scrolls of computing, right? Like this is an, an evolving area, right? <laughs> And the, the way that we sort of keep track of you when it comes to these conceptual objectives is by having you guys come to class and then also participate in recitations, right? Um, I tend to cold call people in class. Hopefully I will know most of your names within a week or two. It's a bigger class than last year, but I think I'm up to the challenge. So, um, and that's how class works, right? Someone last year complained in the evaluations, they were like, somehow he always manages to call on me right when I've zoned out or whatever, right? <laughs> And I don't know, maybe I have a sixth sense for when people have zoned out, right? <laughs> when your eyes start to close or whatever. Um, <laughs> last year the class was at 9 a.m. too. This year the class is in a room that feels like it's about 95 degrees, so that might have the same <laughs> effect as being at 9 a.m. But anyway, please come to class because I, I will notice if you're not here, or I will try to. All right, and we'll, we'll test to make sure you understand things on exams, all right? The second big part of the, so, so this is sort of, sorry, this is sort of what we're gonna do this semester. We're gonna spend a lot of time talking about how sort of three classic examples of how operating systems multiplex and share hardware resources. Three very common hardware resources, the CPU, memory, and disks, right? That's gonna consume a lot of this semester, and each one of those uh, abstractions is different, has different consequences for operating system design, it has a lot of sort of nice story and, and, and elegance to it. So, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about virtualization, and if we have time, there's a bunch of other things we can talk about towards the end of the semester. So, um, learning the concepts, again, attend class, right? I, I usually like to play some music before class. I don't know if I'll be able to get away with that this semester. It was easier when I can get in here at 8.30, but we'll try to do a little bit. It helps wake me up, uh, no matter what time of day it is. Um, and I'll try to be done by 2.50 so you guys can can, can break, hike to whatever part of this, you know, for, you know, God forbidden, snow-covered campus you have to go to. Um, all right, so class is very interactive. I don't come in here with like a, a, a real ironclad, like I am going to get through these slides, so help, you know, so help me. Please stop me, ask questions, you know, shout out things, whatever. Um, I would rather sort of go more slowly and have people more engaged. Uh, but, but I do welcome questions and interruptions during class. Um, and, and the only really way I have of knowing whether you guys are bored, you know, stupefied, confused, is if you say something, right? You know, I, I can't tell by the look on your faces. It doesn't vary that much, right? Um, there is, sorry, this dropped off the bottom of the screen. There, there is a book for the class if you want to buy it. It's not required. I'm not going to assign readings from it. You can see it as a supplemental sort of reference material if you want to know more. But the material I cover in class is what you'll be tested on, and the slides are essentially the book for the class. Right? That's the material that, that I'm going to expect you guys to know. Um, all right, so as far as the programming side of things, right? So by the time you finish this class, I want you to be able to design and implement well-structured, design and implement well-structured system software, right? You guys are going to get a couple of practices to do this. I'll talk about those in a second. Um, one of the things that's difficult when we design operating systems <coughs> is uh, synchronizing access to resources. We're going to, we have a whole assignment devoted to that, and we're going to definitely cover that in class. This is, so how many people have done a lot of multi-threaded programming where they've had to worry about race conditions, synchronization, locking, stuff like that? Okay, by the end of the semester, that, uh, all your hands will be up. And that's, you know, I mean, hey, why would you need to use multi-threaded programming? I mean, come on, computers only have eight cores, right? It's not like there's ever going to be more than one thing happening at once, right? I mean, this is, you guys got to know this stuff, so we're going to get to it. Um, and then also debugging. This is another big part of the class. You guys will spend a lot of time and effort doing this. And again, because of the lack of visibility you have frequently into operating system state, debugging is difficult, right? And it encourages a different style of debugging, right? A lot of, a lot of us, um, when we have the chance, I think debug in ways that are you know, not entirely efficient, right? Uh, operating systems make you think a lot, formulate hypotheses, and sort of test them in a more rigorous way, right? Because you don't have the same type of visibility or the same great debugging tools that you might have when developing in other languages. And then we're also going to do a little bit on performance, I hope, this year for assignment three, right? So uh, improving performance, building performance systems is really important, clearly, too, right? Um, can you guys in the back still hear me? Is my voice starting to? Okay. And then for the, uh, for the programming assignments, we know these assignments are hard. We're going to give you guys a lot of help. And please come make use of it, right? I mean, last year we had TAs doing like 20 office hours a week. 
and for a month there was nobody there, right? So, and then for the last week, there was everybody there sleeping there all the time, right? So <laughs> that's not really a great <laughs> resource allocation uh, thing, and, and we're, we're going to fix that a little bit. I'll tell you more about it, right? So there are four major programming assignments in this class. Well, there aren't really four major ones. There's two major ones, but there are four programming assignments, right? Um, the first assignment is a very, very brief introduction, just gets you started with the development environment, bootstrapped, how to use some of the tools that we use is very simple, right? Uh, the second one is about synchronization primitives, and that starts to get a little bit more challenging, although it's not, not a, a, a huge lift. The final two assignments are you know, the big meat of the class, right? So for assignment two, you're, we're going to ask you to actually implement the Unix system call interface. So uh, the little proto-kernel that we give you does not have support for the file system calls or any other kind of system call. We're going to ask you to build that support, test it, and get it to work, right? Yeah? Are these all do the same thing? Uh, yeah, we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> oh gosh, it's a typo. No. Um, so, so they are, let me, let me come back to that. That's a good question. Um, and then, they're not all due the same day. The, the last one has a different due. <laughs> okay? Just the last one. Um, and then for, for assignment three, we're going to actually ask you to implement virtual memory. And this is my favorite assignment in the class. I think it's the coolest assignment. It's hard. It's challenging. It asks you to build a big, complex system with lots of internal interfaces. And it's, it's cool, though. And in both of these assignments, there are these big payoffs when you get done, right? When assignment two, when you're done, you can actually run real user programs, which is pretty neat on your little emulated kernel. And assignment three, when you're done, you can actually let those, run those programs forever and let them use as much memory as they want, and your system should, should continue to operate, right? Um, there is a lot more on this stuff on the web. I just wanted to give you guys a brief overview. Um, the, the, the development environment we use for this class is something, I, sort of a legacy from my days at Harvard. Um, it's called OS 161. It was designed for instructional operating systems courses like this one, right? And the reason, what it tries to do, so if you think about you know, a class like this, it's like, well, we want you to build an operating system. Well, how do I do that, right? Um, I could hack on Linux, right? How many people think I could get you up and hacking on Linux within three months? I don't think I'm capable of it. Uh, you know, I mean, Linux is, Linux is a beast. You know? It's a big, mature, complex operating system. And so asking you to go replace the Linux virtual memory manager is sort of a meaningless task, right? Like you could spend years of your life doing it, right? It would probably take you a year just to get it out so that you could start over, right? <laughs> um, so, so we don't start with a big, mature, existing operating system. We give you a little, uh, I don't want to call it a toy operating system. It's not. It's designed for this. Uh, and we let you build out parts of it, right? Um, the kernel that you're going to build runs in an emulator, which is also built for this class. This stuff is all very lightweight, right? Part of the legacy of this class is this also started before the days of sort of real aggressive virtualization. So maybe if we did this again, we would you know, have you develop in VMware and, and get to hack on like a virtualized hardware machine. But, but this is, I think, a little bit better. Uh, the Sys161 emulator is very fast, too. It boots a, you know, a little command line kernel pretty quickly. So it's a, it's a short debugging cycle, whereas booting a real kernel takes a long time. Um, you guys will get to know this stuff after assignment zero. All right. Um, so the class is, uh, I just want to just address the sort of difficulty level of this course uh, briefly. And maybe a little bit more briefly. So um, this class is hard, right? Uh, I think one of the things that will strike you and always strikes me about operating systems is the core principles behind operating systems are, are extremely simple and elegant, right? Operating system designers tend towards simplicity when designing algorithms and data structures. And you know, what, what we'll find over and over again when we see how operating system designers have solved problems is they don't pick the fanciest, schmanciest algorithm from the back of your algorithms textbook and try to implement it to do page replacement because it's complicated, it's hard to get right, and it's actually usually not that much better than something that's a lot simpler, right? On the other hand, the reason for this is that getting even simple things to work in operating system environments is frequently very difficult, right? And so the implementation stuff is quite hard, right? So conceptually understanding how to do these assignments I don't think is that challenging. Getting them to work is, is the big part of the problem, right? Um, therefore, this class is not easy. Right? So these were our, uh, 
our scores last year on appropriate workload in the course evaluation. And you can see that we were, this is the only category where we were below the average, right? Um, and we were kind of significantly below the average for 421. I guess the 421 students really, really thought this was hard, which is fine. Um, on the other hand, the scores for the class overall were quite good, right? So I hope that by the time we're done, you know, you guys don't think that this is a waste of time. You don't think that we've we spent all this time and energy and haven't gotten much out of it. You know, the, the overall reviews for the class, I'll put these up again, are, were really positive, right? A lot of people said this is the best course they ever took at UB. This was really worthwhile. I've had students come and tell me that these are the exact type of questions that they've been asked about for job interviews and stuff like that. So I, I think that this class works, right? But I, I just want to sort of establish a little bit of an agreement here, which is that I'm not doing this to torture you guys, right? Uh, I like you guys already, you know, we just <laughs> met. But, um, but it is going to be hard, and we are going to give you as much help as you can. But I've, I've tried to make this class as easy as I can without losing the point, right? Which is to give you a chance, to guys, guys a chance to do this stuff and to learn, right? All right, any questions about the content of the class before we start talking about policies? Yeah. No windowing environments, no way, yeah, yeah. That would be awesome, right? <laughs> but slow, I'm guessing, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that, that whole stack is not, not super interesting. But any other questions? Great question. Yeah? How does risk and sys play into the music viewer uh, sys? Uh, this is, a, this is a, actually emulating a MIP, so it's a risk architecture, right? It's a great question. We should come, come back to that like a month from now, right? Because it's, it's a really cool question, but I think it's a little out of context. But once we know a little bit more, that'll be a fun thing to talk about. Any other questions? Yeah. Can we go back to that due date stuff? I'm going to get there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we'll, we'll, we're going to talk about due dates. Yeah, I shouldn't have put them on that slide. Oh, I was foiled by my own. <laughs> yeah, any other questions before we go on? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I am going to cover that too. So, so let me just forge ahead, because we're getting, I think you guys are getting into the good stuff. But before I go any farther, I, I really want to introduce the core staff. I'm super excited about the core staff this year. I have awesome TAs. I've got, you know, you guys, I think, are, have a really, really great staff. They're going to be super helpful. These people know the assignments. They know how to help you. They've done this before. So let's see here. Without any further ado, Zihei. Where is Zihei? There she is. Stand up and, and wave. So Zihei was a TA last year. She's awesome. Um, she's a PhD student. Um, we also have Yavas. You guys stay standing until we're done. Yavas Yilmaz, who's a, what year PhD student are you? Fifth year PhD student, right? So this guy is old and wise, right? <laughs> He's going to be able to help you. Um, Jinghao, Jinghao Shu, uh, is a first year PhD student. He basically wrote the blog on this class, uh, which a lot of you guys will be reading to help learn how to do some of the assignments. So, so he is really uh, skilled. And then Guru, where is he? Yes. Who's an actual Linux hacker now, which is awesome. Last, when, when he TA'd the class last year, he wasn't quite a Linux hacker, but now he's an actual Linux hacker, right? So this guy's hacking on a real operating system, right? Um, so let's give these guys a round of, a, a round of applause already. <laughs> so this year, I'm also. He's, oh, right, yeah, 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 well, whatever. I think of Jing Hao as a second year TA, because he was around so much last year helping out that he was basically like an uh, unofficial TA. Um, all right, so, so this year we're going to do something else, too, which is that there's a couple of students that are working with me this semester who have taken the class before who have offered to help out holding some office hours every week. Um, I'm referring to them as, as ninjas. I don't know why. I think I picked this up from something I read on the web. Um, and and these, so these guys will be doing some office hours. They won't be grading. Um, but, and they may be helping out in the forums or whatever. But these, uh, all three of these students took the class two years ago. They all did really, really well. Right? So they know these assignments. They're full of advice. Uh, so without any further, is John here? I haven't seen him yet. There he is. All right, you guys have to stand up too. John Gerber. Uh, Scott Hasley and Carl Nusli. Nusli. All right, let's give these guys a round of applause too. So these guys, these guys are volunteers who are here out of the goodness of their hearts, right? They'll be doing a couple of office hours a week, uh, but you know, just so you know who they are, and, and these guys know the assignments, 
so you, if you ask them, they will be very helpful. All right. Uh, okay, so this, this is like, I don't know. I'm, I'm super excited because this is, <laughs> it's the first year I've taught this class where the website was actually ready on the first day that I taught the class. Right? It's embarrassing, but anyway, um, I've been telling people, like, I feel strangely calm, right? Uh, because the last couple years when I've taught this class, I've been like desperately trying to finish things, and they usually drag on. So, um, but basically, like, so you can log on now and start assignment zero, right? Um, you, there's a couple of steps you have to follow before you get started. Um, you need to find a partner, and I'll put an SSH key. I'll talk about the partnering thing in a minute. The website has lots of useful information about how to, you know, how to approach the assignments. There's long write-ups of every assignment. You're going to submit everything through the website. Um, there's lots of stuff here. So here, ah, here's the website. Sweet. Where's my mouse? Oh, I got to go over here, I guess. Uh, there it is. Okay. So, and yeah. So there's there's video. There all the course videos will be posted. Here's the ones from last year. These are um, YouTube playlists, so you guys can sign up. Um, the assignments are here, so this shows you sort of like assignment zero. Every assignment, I want to point this out and come back to it later, has very clear collaboration guidelines. So this assignment tells you specifically what you should do to help yourself and help each other. Um, some things here that we don't want you to do but aren't going to punish you for doing, and then the things down here that we will fail you for doing. Right? So these assignments are very clear about how to do this. Um, there's all sorts of useful information here about you know, how to work with each other, how to use Git, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, this all works, believe it or not. Uh, and there's a bunch of other useful stuff here. The only other thing I want to point out, uh, you guys can peruse this later, obviously. I can't believe I'm doing this, actually. I used to sit in these meetings with administrators who would show me how to use a website. And I was like, yeah, I'm not five, right? Uh, but anyway, I'm showing you how to use a website, so I'm a little embarrassed. But um, so, so anyway, the, the website has a calendar, too, right? And this calendar we will keep up to date, right? Next week, all the office hours that we post will be on there. All the recitations are on there, exam dates, assignment due dates, et cetera. Right? So please go check out the website. It, it works, which is awesome. Uh, anyway, sorry. So I couldn't resist that. I'm just so proud of it. Um, so the grading for this class is essentially divided right down the middle between the conceptual and the programming aspects of the course. Right? The conceptual part will be half of your grade. The uh, programming parts will be half your grade. By the way, all this stuff's in the syllabus, if you guys want to review it later. I just want to go over it. There's a couple of things I want to emphasize. Right? On Wednesday, we're going to hold what's called our preterm exam. Right? The preterm exam is some data collection I do every year to understand the composition of the class and the type of thing, this, things that you guys are familiar with. It's not graded. You may never see the result for it. Um, but it is four free percentage points if you show up and take it. Right? Pretty simple, right? It's multiple choice. It takes people about 20, 25 minutes, um, usually, unless you really care about your answers. I've had people refuse to turn them in. I'm like, who cares? <laughs> Just turn it in, right? If you don't turn it in, you won't get four points. Um, <laughs> so if you don't do the preterm exam, essentially, I'll scale the other parts of your grade appropriately. Um, the programming assignments are all up here. I'm going to speed up a little bit because I want to get to some other things. Um, so at this point, Almost all the assignment grading, especially the big chunks of the assignments, is automated. Right? So you guys submit your code, we run some tests on it, and you get a, you get a result back. And that happens all pretty synchronously. Right? Some of the bigger assignments take a little longer to grade, but you'll receive an email when they're finished. Right? What this means is that you can have your assignments graded whenever you want to. Right? You think you're done, you think you've earned the grade you want, you can submit it, it'll get graded, it'll show you what you want, and then you can decide if you want to keep going. Right? And therefore, you can just stop when you're done right? and go on to the next assignment. Right? Uh, some of the parts of the assignments, including anything that's graded by humans, namely the TAs, um, there's limits to how many times you can submit things because there's limits to how much time I want them to grade things. Right? Um, so, but for all of the, like, the programming assignments, as well as some of the scripting stuff for assignment zero, there's these, these scripts. And these are, these are working. Right? So you can, you can start today, and you could do a marathon. You could be done with assignment three in a month. And then you could start coming to class again. Uh, and you, you might actually be able to pass doing that. Uh, it's not terrible. Right, so now what we've done, <laughs> so the first year, we're, we're searching for the right approach here. The first year, every assignment had a deadline, and there were the, we had late days and whatever. And then I started to think, well, you know, you guys are all you know, grown-ups. You guys are adults. It's time to learn how to manage your own time. So last year, we only had one deadline, which was the very end of the class. And Predictably, what do you think people did? <laughs> right. 
So this year, we're <laughs> this year we're trying to different sort of middle ground, sort of split the baby kind of thing, where we're going to have two deadlines, right? The first, yeah, this is, this is the sad history of, of deadlines in this class. Um, yeah, the one big deadline actually didn't work very well at all. Uh, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> it worked better. It worked better than bad. Um, so there are two deadlines, right? As, as I've showed up, I showed before, the, essentially everything up through the first large assignment, which is assignment two, is due right before spring break. It's like the Wednesday before spring break. The deadline is on the calendar. Assignment three, by itself, you get another like two months to do. Right? Assignment three is hard. And I want you guys to do well. Last year, what happened is people waited, 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 didn't get done with assignment two, and then a lot of them never even attempted assignment three. Right? So I don't want that to happen again. Um, part of the other uh, consequence of this, though, is that we're not going to distribute solution sets for any of the assignments. Right? Uh, so I suggest that you actually get in a working assignment two submitted before the deadline, because if you don't, you'll still have to do assignment two in order to get assignment three to work. You just won't get any points for assignment two at that point. Right? So that's not a great, that's not a great place to be. Um, all right. So. As far as partnering, someone asked about this before. We ask students to do the course in pairs. There's a variety of reasons for this. One is that the assignments are hard, and working with someone else is helpful as far as divvying up the work, as well as just like having someone to complain to when things don't work, and someone is like a source of support and to like bring you Red Bull when you're in the middle of your like big push to get like some piece of it to work or whatever. So I, I think the, the pairwise programming uh, is really important. It also teaches you how to use the collaboration tools that we ask you to use, including the Git source control uh, tool. And it's just good practice for the rest of your programming life in which you will not implement things by yourself, right? You will be working on a team. The team will use tools like this. The team will have all sorts of coding conventions and standards that are built to help people work together. And you will have to fit in, right? So um, essentially, all that goes to saying that we do not allow people to work alone unless there are very unusual circumstances, right? And again, I want to work alone is not an unusual circumstance. Right? That's pretty normal. Uh, we want you to work with other people. That's actually part of what we're trying to teach you. Right? So don't think of it as us trying to make your life more difficult. Think of it as a, as a new skill that you need to learn right? in order to survive in the, in the wider world of programming. Right? If, you, if you think you deserve one of these extremely unusual exceptions, and your rationale does not boil down to, I want to work alone, then please contact us and we'll talk about it. There are some corner cases here where, um, where we might be flexible about. All right. Um, there's a mailing list. Uh, you guys are all signed up for it. I haven't used it yet, but I'll send out something later today. If you don't get it, you can sign yourself up. If for some reason you're not registered for the class yet, or you don't, um, you're just coming for lecture, but you want to be on the official course communication list, so you can sign up here. Um, however, uh, most of the stuff we distribute will be on Piazza. Right? I signed everybody up for Piazza earlier. Probably a lot of you guys got some sort of auto-generated email from them. Uh, that's where we're going to. Uh, post a lot of stuff. And you guys are responsible for the material that we post on Piazza. Right? You can think of that as, as anything that the staff posts there, uh, you're responsible for as a student. Right? So if we say, hey, here's the answer to one of the exam questions, and you show up and you're like, I never saw that, well, then you're going to have to solve that one rather than you know, taking our answer. Um, there are, we have a couple of email aliases set up for contacting the course staff and for contacting me. Right? Uh, but before you send us email, you know, please walk through a couple of steps in your mind. Right? There, there are like 200 of you this semester. There's one of me. I've got four TAs and three ninjas. Um, so just think about the math there. Right? I'm particularly thinking, can I find this on the website? Right? Have you looked on the website for two or three minutes for this inv information? If no, go to the website and look. Right? Um, is the answer to this question likely to benefit other students and something that we would be willing to share with other students? If the answer to that is yes, ask it on Piazza, and then everybody can see it. Right? There are cases when you need to contact the course staff. There aren't very many cases where you need to contact the course staff. Right? Um, in particular, if, if you email me, um, please, A, use the email alias that's linked off the website. This is so I can filter your email to a folder where I can you know, make sure I pay attention to it, and B, if it's something that was really better designed for the core staff, then I, I might not actually respond. Sometimes I forget to respond, or I just think this person will figure this out anyway by themselves eventually if I give them enough time. Um, so essentially, you know, the less time we spend answering repetitive email, the most time we can spend actually helping you with stuff, right? Like important things. 
Um, so Jing Hao and Guru are going to be holding the recitations uh, this year. We, un unfortunately, this year there's been a change to the department policy. There are only two recitations scheduled for this course. One of them is at 8 in the morning. Uh, the recitations are in rooms that only hold 50 students, and so I don't think we can accommodate graduate students in the recitations. I'd like to. If, you, um, if this upsets you, email Ida and complain, because I think this is a stupid policy. Um, and we have been able, apparently, to add one more weekly help session, as, as what they're going to call it. And we'll use the results of the doodle poll about when to hold office hours to try to find the best time for everybody. I can't guarantee it's going to be at a time that everybody can make, right? But we will try to schedule that one additional pseudo recitation at a time where as many people can make it as possible and in as large a room as possible, right? Um, the recitations are going to cover sort of a mixture of material that's designed to help you on the programming assignments and material that's designed to help you uh, on the exams and sort of review of material from class, right? All right, I just said that. Great. Um, office hours. So all four TAs and the ninjas are going to hold office hours. The deal I make with my TAs is because I've done all this work to automate a lot of the grading that was really, I mean, when I took this class, none of this stuff was automated. So I would sit there with like 10 kernels at night, like running them and being like, did it crash this test? Yes or no? Like click my little spreadsheet, right? It was terrible, right? So now this is done in a more automated fashion. I've asked them to spend more time holding office hours. Right? So last year, I think we held like 17 office hours a week. This year, we have a bigger class. I have more TAs. We'll hold more. Right? And some of the office hours will be staffed by multiple TAs. Right? So there should be a lot of time during the week when you guys can come into Davis and get help with the assignments. Right? Yeah? No. No. So yeah, good, good question. Recitations and office hours, everything starts next week. Right? Uh, right now, we're running a poll. The poll is linked up on the website to figure out when to schedule the office hours, right? So please go to the website, click on the doodle poll, <laughs> fill in the times that you can make it, and based on the results of that over the weekend, we'll figure out when we're going to schedule the office hours and we'll post them on the calendar or email. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and office hours are the place to come when you need help on the programming assignments, and in fact, they're, they're the place to come to just do the assignments, right? Like, it's, it's a lot more fun, I think, to like be working on these assignments around other people that are struggling with the same things. And then the nice thing is, it doesn't have to be like, oh, I got stuck. I went to Davis. You know, I got on the shuttle. And three hours later, I got to Davis. And then office hours were over, right? It could be like, oh, I'm already at office hours. And so I've generated a question. Now I can go get an answer right away, right? So I would really encourage you guys to just come to office hours and work there. Right? I mean, that's, that's a good place to do the programming assignments where you have people there ready to help you. All right, so just a, br a brief caveat about partner work. Partner groups are jointly responsible for your submissions. Right? If one of you guys submits plagiarized materials, you're both going to fail. Right? Uh, you need to figure out how to work that out with your partner. If you're not comfortable about something your partner is doing, please come and contact the course staff so we can address that as soon as possible. Any other questions about this? Um, and, and again, every one of the assignments has very clear collaboration guidelines, and you are required to indicate that you agree to them every time you submit an assignment. Right? So there's, there's going to be none of this business of, oh, I didn't know what it said. I mean, every time you submit something, there's a checkbox that you have to check. And you'll probably get tired of checking it over and over again right? as you submit things repeatedly to see if you've fixed the bug. Right? But it's there because this way we make sure that everybody's familiar with the policies at the time they submit. All right, so the, the other reason to come to office hours and work together is because you know, the course staff for this class, I wish you know, that the right way to teach this class would be to have 20 TAs right, for a class this size. Right? I've got four. Okay? So we're going to be working a lot to help you guys. We're trying to be as efficient as we can. But please help each other. Right? The people in this class are one of your best sources of help. You post things on Piazza. You ask somebody at office hours. There's, you know, I'm, I'm very happy with there will be a lot of information exchange about how people are approaching problems, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Um, and, and good classes come through this course together. Right? And they build relationships with people in the class through office hours and through Piazza. And they use those relationships to help sort of as a source of support and to help them fix things and, and move through the assignments. Right? All right. So, Brief, um, I hate to end on a bummer note, but um, all right, so this is my collaboration policy other than the stuff that's online. Um, essentially, if you start cutting and pasting code back and forth and, and sending an email, you're cheating, 
right? If you talk about code, you say, oh, well, you need to do this before you do that. You know, you should acquire the lock before you release it, blah, 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 blah. That's fine, right? As soon as you start, um, you know, actually speaking in, like, you know, uh, alphanumeric characters, like L-O-C-K underscore A-C-Q-U-I-R-E, you know, left parentheses, right parentheses, semicolon, right? Then you have a problem, right? Or if you just do this in some other less stupid way, right? Like cutting it to an email or whatever, right? Um, so this class, I hope by now, has required a reputation for being very hard on cheaters, right? Um, if you're interested in cheating and you'd like to leave the program, it's a great place for you to be, right? Because that, that is what will happen, right? And I do this not because, you know, I'm, I'm some sort of angry person with this deep well of hatred towards students. It's because I actually have a huge amount of support for the people who are here who are going to try their best and who are going to submit stuff that doesn't quite work and aren't going to get a perfect grade, but the whole time have never considered or gone on the internet and just downloaded a solution from somewhere else and submitted it as their own work, right? So I want to stick up for the second group of people, and that means sticking it to the first group of people, right? Um, we use sort of a, a fairly sophisticated submission checker, and at this point we have this huge library of submissions, right? Stuff we found on the internet, stuff people submitted in prior years, all sorts of things, right? I've got this huge corpus of assignments, and we check every one of your submissions against them, right? And any sort of suspicious uh, matches are investigated by me, right? Um, and, and, this, and again, this, this bag of you know, previous assignments is much bigger this year, right? So your chances of slipping anything by us are, are decreasing every year, and they were already pretty small before, right? If you cheat on one of these assignments, you will fail the class, right? You will receive an F for the course, not for the assignment. That's departmental policy. It's also my policy. Yeah. Let's, let's put it this way. If you want to borrow code from somewhere, you should ask us about it. Right? Uh, most of what you produce for this class, we expect to be your own work. Right? That's, that's my, default, my default assumption. <laughs> right? If for some reason there's like an implementation of some weird data structure you just want to cut and paste in, and if it's not like at the heart of what the assignment is about, then we might consider it, but my, my blanket answer would probably be no. Right? Um, the, the other thing to keep in mind is that these are big assignments, right? So for some of the other courses you've taken, maybe there were like three or four lines of code that you had to get in the right order. We're talking about thousands of lines of code for these assignments you're going to be submitting. And so when we find plagiarism, oh, it's super obvious, right? It's like, oh, these 100 lines of code match character to character, you're done, right? At that point, it's over. It's, it's very hard to go, oh, I just accidentally produced the exact same piece of code. <laughs> Hundreds of lines of it, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, and this year, uh, we're also going to get started on this after assignment, too. All right. Uh, last thing. I'm almost out of time. Um, if Buffalo, if, if you're wondering about whether to come to class, it's a little bit less of an issue now because it's not at 9 a.m. anymore. Thank you. Um, but if Buffalo public schools are closed for the day, we will not have class. Right? I live in Buffalo, so if they're closed, I'm not leaving. Um, any questions about the course policies? I'm done one minute early. Anything? There's lots of information online. I'll stick around for a little bit out side class if you have questions or whatever. Um, Wednesday is the preterm examination. Please bring a pen and pencil, uh, and we'll see you then. Now it's